Chris Lang covers the Lynchburg Hillcats for the Sports Buffet in addition to his work with the Liberty Flames, and he's just a devout sports fan, so who better to talk sports with? Chris Lang on the Sports Buffet podcast, talking Hillcats, talking Penn State football, talking Major League Baseball, and talking more. Talking to Chris Lang, Lynchburg News in Advance, does a lot of stuff for the paper, including covering the Lynchburg Hillcats, who have been having a pretty good go of it. Uh, got a little road bump here against Frederick lately, but uh, talk a little bit about the Hillcats. What have you seen out of this club that uh, would make you happy if you're an Atlanta Braves fan for the future? Well, the the guys that are not here anymore probably are the th- things that would make you happy. I mean, J.R. Graham, especially the pitcher that uh, was an all-star, he was, he was the uh, kind of the bedrock of the rotation areas that he got called up from Mississippi deservedly so because uh, he pitched so well here. He's a guy that I think uh, he pitched in Danville last year. Um, he, he could quickly get to the majors. I don't, I don't know if he's a back-end starter or if he's a, uh, a reliever or, or something like that, but uh, he's, got, he's got tremendous stuff and uh, uh, good two, three pitch uh, mix and, and uh, you know, he, he pretty much dominated hitters in this league and he's, and he's doing fairly well up in Mississippi as well. Uh, right now, they're, they're really hurt. They're banged up. I mean, Tommy Ostello may, may be out for the season. Uh, Matt Licka is out for the season. He had uh, uh, season-ending uh, surgery on his hamstring that, that had been bugging him all year, so so he's been shut down. Um, they're, they're just uh, they need to get healthy and, and try to get back on a little bit of a roll. I talked to Chris Garcia, the first baseman, the other day, and he's you know basically was like you know we we can't wait till the last week of the season to start getting rolling for the playoffs. You gotta you gotta you know get into that uh, sort of mindset now. And I think they they uh, it was a tough series against Frederick, who's <laughs> not been the best. They've been the worst team in the league all year, so um, they, they certainly uh, need to get something going here in the next couple of weeks so they can uh, enter the playoffs on some sort of uh, momentum. What about in terms of the teams that you have come that you've seen come into Lynchburg? Uh, obviously, I know Dylan Bundy has pitched here twice for Frederick. Uh, talk to me about some of the other prospects that you've seen that you uh, have caught your uh, keen eye. Yeah, a lot of the guys have, uh, have moved up or have been traded. Myrtle Beach just had, uh, you know, Cody Buttel was their, their number one pitcher, went up at the uh, at the All-Star break. He was fantastic to watch. Um, Matt Barnover at Salem, um, he's, he's a guy that uh, that certainly has an opportunity to uh, to, to be a fast mover in, that, in the Red Sox system. Um, the, the, in the Denster deal, they, uh, the Cubs actually acquired two of the Myrtle Beach Pelicans, but Kyle Hendricks was probably their best pitcher left, and then... Uh, on the way to their third baseman, it was fantastic. So, um, those, those definitely are guys that, that have caught my eye. Um, yeah, I'll be honest with you, I can't remember if I've even seen Potomac this year. <laughs> I seem to seem to uh, miss uh, covering games anytime the Nationals are in town. So, I'm not sure. Uh, I may have seen them once in April, and that was when Anthony Rendon was hurt. So, I, I, I don't know what they have. I know they've got a couple of uh, high level pitching prospects there now. And uh, Carolina's got some, some guys that. Uh, uh, that are okay, but the Indian farm system is really, really sparse uh, right now. So. Did you get a chance to see Bundy? Yeah, I did. I covered that game the other night. Uh, talked to him afterwards. Um, you know, they they, uh, they took the reins off him a little bit. They've been uh, holding him to three, four, five inning starts for, for most of the year, but he went seven innings against the Hillcats, two hits, one earned. Um, just he was, uh, I think he was hyped as a bat. I mean, he's, he's got a fastball that sits in the mid 90s. He's got a, a, a changeup that's just. It's a moving change of almost. It kind of darts in and out at you, and uh, and his curveball was, was was just filthy. And that was completely working. Uh, spray out pitch, and um, you know I think he's he's certainly ready to move quickly to the system. He's pretty mature for, for a 19 year old. And you can see he's polished when you talk to him, and um, he's, he's a guy that, uh, that that certainly is, is mature enough, I think, to handle the challenges going forward. I'm not sure how much he'll uh, go. The Orioles have a tendency with their young guys to, to put them in double A and then maybe not necessarily send them up to, uh, to North or to triple A. So uh, maybe he goes up and makes a couple starts at three. Maybe he's on the 40 man roster. Maybe you, uh, uh, when they expand the rosters, send him to Baltimore just to, just to add him in the bullpen and, and get to learn for some major league pitchers and, and, and get some experience that way. Well, I do know you're an Orioles fan. Uh, how, how, how would you take, if you were in charge of Dylan Bundy's development, I know you're not a pitching coach or anything, but. How? When would you like to see him advance to Bowie or wherever? Uh, when, you know, when he's ready. When he's uh, when, he, when he's completely dominant. Uh, you know, like he was at Del Mar, but he was he was so dominant that there was no challenge left for him at that uh, at that level. You know, he got hit a little bit in his first couple of starts at Frederick, and I think that the Orioles needed to see how he responded to that, what kind of adjustments he made. You know, the Hillcats actually hit him 
far twice as they, they, they get the war start of his uh, of his career. Um, his, his very brief career uh, back in June. So uh, he was I think he was highly motivated to uh, to uh, come back at them the other night and and, and that. So um, you know you just it, it's when he's when he's not challenged anymore. I think that's the, the thing with any pitcher. You, it, there's no point in just holding him down here for you know no reason. If he's ready, he's ready. You know I think that was the same thing with, with Bryce Harper when they moved him from Hagerstown to uh, straight up to Double A. It's like you know do you really need to go from low A at, at, to, to high A at that point? You know why not go straight up to Double A and see what you can do? How much did the Orioles do the right thing by not uh, really kind of purging the farm system just to get a, a two month rental? Oh, it was absolutely the right, the right decision. I mean, you can't. They, they, the guys that they were talking about getting rid of were uh, for Joe Blanton, and were just mind boggling. They were talking about the, the show the, uh, the second best prospect, and you, you can't you can't trade him. I mean, the, Brad Roberts is out for the season again with an injury, um, so, so you, you just you don't have any sort of any older to begin with. So you have you need future guys at second base, and and uh, you know Buster Olney's pointed this out several times in his blogs this year. Uh, you know, even if you make the flash ring, you're guaranteed to get in a home game. Right. You know, so, so you know, there's there's no mess necessarily to chase that wild card. But that second wild card, you're, you're, there's no even financial incentive for that. So it's it's great for your fan base to say, hey, you're at least in the playoffs. But um, yeah, you you just you don't want to blow up the farm system for for a, a guy like no offense to Joe Blanton, but for a guy like Joe Blanton, I mean, if you could have gotten Dempster, okay, that's different because Dempster's a high level pitcher. With Blanton, so you know, Ham and Agger gets. Uh, uh, middling around with a close to a five year array in the, in the National League. So uh, I don't think you uh, definitely did not want to sell the farm for him. I was happy about that. I love the Ham and Egger reference. I haven't heard that since the old days of Gorilla Monsoon. So uh, <laughs> definitely like that. Uh, in terms of Brian Roberts, is it, t- I mean, if I'm not an Orioles fan, but as an observer, I think you almost got to pretty much start moving on without him like he's never going to play again for you. Yeah, no, I agree because every time he gets out, he was great for the, about two weeks he was healthy this <laughs> I mean, he's, and, and, the, and the problems he's had, he's had back problems, he's had shoulder problems, and, and, and leg issues, and it's just, yeah, you, you just wonder with a guy like, that, 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 that's at that age, that has been rehabbing so much, I mean, he's, he's been a great help to the organization, but you're right, I think you start you know, seeing what you can do with, uh, with with some other second base prospects, even if it's a free agent signing, or, or, or guys within your own system, but I don't think you can really count on them, for sure. If you were any team out there, would you claim Cliff Lee on waivers? Because um, I, 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 mean, I can think of 25 yeah. million reasons not to. Exactly, exactly. And I, I yeah, the, the only team of the, that has money to do is the Yankees. So I don't, I don't know if they really need to. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I don't know if you do that. I just I don't see if they're you see the uh, is this contract up after this year? No, 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 no. He's oh. got at least uh, I want to say probably two, if not three more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you you can't commit to that. And, even the Yankees, I don't think would commit to that. It's just so. You know, the Texas Rangers are the one team, though, that could pop out to me. Has because I think Nolan Ryan has such an investment on pitching, and you know, I mean, honestly, does Josh Hamilton come back next year? I don't know. Right. I mean, and I'm, Michael Young. What do you do with Michael Young? I mean, he's he's older. Right. Um, you're right. This, I mean, the window for this for this particular group is is pretty much set to close. So maybe the Rangers go after him, and they, you know, and they. they they did get uh, they did get Dempster, which helps them. Right. And uh, uh, they, they, but they do need more pitching help. I don't think they're they're done with that. So um, yeah, yeah, you're right. They, they may be a group that they could be interested in. Hopping back over to some other sports real quick. Uh, it's been a few weeks, but uh, the punishment uh, handed down to the Nittany Lions of Penn State was uh, really <laughs> severe. I'm not going to say harsh, but uh, definitely severe. And you know, part of me, if I'm a Penn State fan, would have almost won the death penalty. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I, 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 you, you would say that at the same time. Um, you're, 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 if, you're, if you're a fan, you say that. If you're a business owner in State College, Pennsylvania, where you completely depend on football Saturdays to, to boost you up for, for an entire fall, uh, you, you would not say that. But uh, that's kind of, and again, that's where the priorities should come into play that, 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 that we were talking about the whole time. Um, yeah, it was, it was crazy severe. We were out on the uh, golf course at the agency kickoff, and that came down. It was just funny, you know, if, if, if you're out there uh, 10 years ago, you'd have to wait until you're done with the, uh, with the round to find out what was happening, but everybody was on their, on their iPhones or their droids or whatever, straight at 9 o'clock trying to figure out exactly what happened, and it was just like, it was almost breathtaking to see the penalties that, that, were, that were meted out, and they were the right calls. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't harbor a child molester within your program and, and, and turn a blind eye to it for the sake of not tarnishing your legacy, and then get away with it. It stinks to the kids that are in the program, I'll say that, but but you, it, there was an institutional 
and certainly I think the NCAA did, did everything uh, seemingly within their power and in and, and some regards with it outside of their power because that's, that's something if they had gone through their usual talk with committee and everything it would have been seven years before it got to yeah. uh, nailed down so. does, does this come off almost too harsh in terms of a uh, Roger Goodell type penalty of if something happened and I would hope nothing like this ever happens again but if something uh, really severe happens again that uh, Mark Emmert and crew can just uh, drop the hammer I mean is it do they I guess my question would be do they need kind of a little bit of a an oversight or, you know, I mean, because with Roger Goodell, when he hands out a penalty, I mean, judge, jury, executioner, pretty much right there. Yeah. This is such an unprecedented case. I mean, this is not something you see um, at any point. This wasn't just NCAA violations or anything like that. I mean, it's, uh, I, I think you can have an exception for a case like that. I, I don't know if he'll go outside the say, when everything goes down in Miami. That was, a lot of that stuff is it's stuff that's covered by the NCAA and it's recruiting violations or whatnot. That'll go through more of NCAA rules. But, uh, yeah, the, the somebody, I'd say we're talking about Montana, they, they need to be concerned with, uh, they're not high profile like Penn State, but they've got, uh, you know, their starting quarterback just got charged with, uh, formally charged with, uh, with rape up there, so he's been suspended with, from the team. Another player has been uh, charged with rape. There, there seemingly is a culture out there of, where, where the Missoula Police Department is, is uh, turning a blind eye to things, I guess, and that's why there's a federal investigation in there. The yes, NCAA is in there. You, you wonder if, if, if people in Montana are like, you know, hey, they, they went outside the box for Penn State. This is sort of something up here that's outside the box when it comes to the NCAA. They're, they're not uh, uh, violating NCAA rules, but they're violating moral rules by not having a rain on their players uh, after after games. So, you know, they think they, they ought to be if I, uh, if I watch what happened at Penn State, for sure. Yeah, and you know, I was talking to Aaron McFarling of the Roanoke Times the other day, and we had a little bit of a uh, disagreement because I said it's very sad what happens happened to Joe Paterno, and Aaron took issue and said, you know, it's not sad at all. He has no sympathy. I think what I meant by sad is it's sad that people have looked up to this man for so long when, you know, he had such a major cloud hanging over him in terms of that. Can you ever think of anybody whose reputation has gone from, you know, up in the heavens to down below like Joe Paterno's has just in the past, you know, six, eight months, I guess. Yeah, I can't think of anybody. I, I, I'm trying to think of anybody that really fell, fell, fell from grace in that sort of regard. So, you know, if, if the, I, yeah, I don't know. If, uh, I'm kind of with Aaron here. I'm not sure if sad is the word just to say it. I mean, it's, it's, um, the people I feel for, I guess, or I probably I feel obviously for the victims, but you know I feel for Joe Paterno's wife and Jerry Sandusky's wife. I, I don't, I, I can't even imagine what it, what it's got to be like to be Jerry Sandusky's wife. To, it, did she know about this? I mean, it, was was she privy to any of this? Or, could, could he have done this for 10, 15 years completely? I mean, there were stories that it was, he was doing it at home, you know. Right. Uh, and how did she not know? Or and, or even if she. Even if you didn't didn't know, um, you know how do you hear that in court and then come to grips with the fact that you married that man? And what about the rest of the coaching staff? Through? Do you think they all knew? That, that's really hard to tell. I, I don't. I don't know the culture of that. It seemed to me, just from afar, it looked like that Joe Paterno was was really a figurehead by the end. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was a guy that had an office. I don't know how involved he was with the day to day coaching. Uh, how often he met individually with players, things like that, just because he was a, he, he was sort of an iconic guy, I mean, I think that they, it was kind of like Bobby Bowden at the end, I'm not sure Bobby Bowden was doing a whole lot of hands-on coaching. Right, but you and I, time. you and I both know that in terms of college, high school, uh, NFL, all sports, that in, during season, coaches are together more with them, with their, with themselves, than they are right. with their own families, so... Yeah. How can Tom Bradley, Larry Johnson, Jay Paterno, Mike McQuarrie, people like that, not know? Yeah. Well, no, obviously Mike McQuarrie knew. But right. <laughs> um, Bad example, but the rest of them. Yeah. 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 The rest of them had to have known something was up. They, they did. There's no way that Mike McQuarrie just told Joe Paterno, and it didn't. <clears throat> and there was no scuttlebutt about, amongst the rest of the staff about it. You know, there's there's no way that was the case. So, um, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Everybody knew. Everybody knew and they covered it up. They didn't. The, the right thing to do is to is, is to go to the police at that point. You can't just say I, I took it to Joe Paterno. I understand that there's the culture of uh, you can't go over your boss's head on certain things. But this is this isn't you know a, a recruiting violation. This 
right. this, is, this is molestation and, and, and rape of small children. This is ridiculous that you can't, that you're thinking of chain of command at that point. I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I agree with the, uh, the notion that, you know, that there, there are a lot of internet tough guys that are like, well, if I were Mike Kapoor, I'd have gone in there and just beat the crap out of Terry Sandusky while I was doing it. I'm like, I mean, sure you would have. <laughs> you, I mean, your, your first reaction would be just disbelief, I would think. Right. And, uh, and, and, but you got, at some point, you've got a moral opposition yourself. And, and it's, uh, it's uh, to just, to, to, to tell somebody, you can't just tell Joe to turn around and say it's done. Right. And, and yeah. Let I mean, him control things. Right, because I mean, I I think when somebody wants to do the right thing, they normally try to carry it out to the end themselves, or at least, you know, kind of check on it to see, hey, whatever happened with that right thing I tried to do. So, anyway, yeah. uh, final question for you, and we'll end it on a happy note. Uh, do you have Olympic fever? Because to me, if you watch, uh, you know, you can't turn on water polo and not get excited. I, you know, the Hungarian women's water polo scares me a little bit. Um, I'll say that so for whatever reason. That's I should watch two Hungary women's water polo games. Um, I've been, you know, I've been watching it more during the day. I've not seen a ton of swimming, um, and I still have a little bit of a beef with NBC for not giving us an option to watch that stuff live. I mean, I guess you could watch it on, on the computer, but uh, um, you know, I, I, I haven't watched swimming the gymnastics. That the, the mainstream stuff doesn't appeal to me as much as, as watching some of the, you know, badminton team handball. And, you know, what and, scandal there with badminton, by the way? What's that? Yeah, seriously. The, the scandalous bed that was uh, Southeast Asia. That's that's crazy. <laughs> to think that that would be a sport that would that would do that. Archery has been fun to watch. Um, to watch a little field hockey. I don't understand how people play field hockey and, and can walk up right afterwards. <laughs> feel, feel like the stick should be longer, but that that's just me. Um, it's it's been it's been fun to watch. I I, 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 I know that there's a, a, a segment of sports fans that, that, that don't really enjoy watching the Olympics. They think it's overhyped and this and that. And, for me, it's like, you know what, I, I can turn on football almost any time. You know, every four years I get to watch uh, these random sports that, 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 that are really obscure and way out of the mainstream. It's kind of interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a nice change-up for me. So I, I, I definitely enjoyed it. Who would ever think, who would ever thought that we could use the word scandal and shuttlecock in the same sentence? Yeah, place? this is true in the same sentence, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Chris, we definitely appreciate it. Look forward to doing it again. As always, appreciate your time.